Good afternoon and welcome to the O'Malley College of Business panel series that was conceived of and is being hosted by our Business Leadership Council. If you're not familiar with our Business Leadership Council, they're a group of executives who come across the entire country and sometimes the world to be here during the semester to provide us and you with input on what's happening in the industry, where our curriculum needs to go, to speak with you about internships and job opportunities, and mostly make certain that the direction of the college is right, that we're moving forward in the aviation, aerospace, and space industries in a way that makes sense. But one of the areas that I've struggled with since I got here, and I was a novice to aviation, aerospace, and space, was understanding how the opportunities here manifest for you, right? I'm a business person, but I wasn't one of you who came in here looking at the sky every time an aircraft went overhead. So it's like, how many jobs are there? What does the business of flight really look like? And I know a lot of you have one direction, right? I'm going to the airlines. I've heard it from several of you. But the point is there's a lot of other opportunities in aviation, aerospace, and space. And the business leadership panel had this idea that if we set up systematically opportunity conversations about where your degree could take you, like, I think I like marketing. If I study marketing, what can I do with that? Or I think I like accounting. Well, what do accountants do in aviation, aerospace, and space? It might make you more aware, and it definitely makes me more aware of what I'm doing and hopefully makes me a better leader. So today's panel is on opportunities in sales and business development. And I hope you'll give your full attention to our wonderful panel and let them, I'll let them introduce themselves. Good afternoon. My name is Steve Becker and congratulations for choosing for the right place to be this afternoon. Good choice. I do not think you'll be disappointed. Before I introduce the panel, I just wanna say a couple things about the panel. Today is for you. Today is for us to give you feedback, to give you information, for you to ask questions, this is your time. We have 60 minutes. Please make the most of it. We'll keep a pretty tight schedule. Um, the initial intention is I'll introduce the panel and I'll let them talk about themselves. And, and then I'll ask some questions of the panel and then you get to ask questions of the panel. So please make the most of it. Do not be shy. If you are shy, perhaps we may call upon you. One thing about salespeople is getting us to shut up. You have a tendency to talk too much, so I promise I won't talk too much. So um, my name is Steve Becker. I work for Delta Airlines uh, at TechOps, the technical division of the airline. Sales executive, I'm responsible for third-party business going into the airline. Um, I'm going to pass it off, and I'm going to go left to right, and I'm going to ask um, uh, my colleagues uh, to tell a little bit about their background. Two things before we get started. Number one, I want to pay, I want you to pay attention to two things. Obviously to what we have to say and the questions that you have for us that we'll answer. But I want you to pay attention to the diversity of the panel. By that, I mean our backgrounds. Listen to what we say. When I say that, I mean, what did we decide to do when we came out of college? Where are we today? And how in the heck did we end up in sales? Some part of our careers. One of the questions I'm gonna ask the panel is, did sales choose us or did we choose sales? And the answers you're going to hear, I think will fascinate you. And for those of you that never thought of sales being a career, I get it. Most of us were there, things change. That being said, I'd like to introduce Scott Daniels, Yulia Malueva from Delta, Scott Daniels from Rosidco, and my colleague from BLC, Roger Schmelzer, who's retired with an amazing career. And I'll let, let you tell about, tell about your, your background. And then Kyle Ludwig from Garmin. Four of us are ERAU graduates, but the reality is I want you to hear about the backgrounds, a lot of diversity, good information. So Scott, we'll start with you. Hello everyone, uh, as Steve said, I'm Scott Daniels. Um, I graduated from Embry-Riddle in 1992. This is um, big changes. I've only been to the campus one time since, and I'm just amazed, astounded by what's happened here. Uh, it's it's a it's a wonderful place. Uh, I've been in the industry now 30 years since that time. I joined the industry uh, 
but I came out of school not exactly knowing what I wanted to do, but uh, I got into aircraft um, reporting. I reported on who was buying and selling aircraft. And it turns out there's a whole world of people out there buying, selling, and leasing aircraft. After a few years, I moved into a position where I was VP of marketing at a company, and I've been doing that ever since. So uh, the company I work for now is Resitco. I've been with them 14 and a half years. And uh, just we, we lease, sell, and, and buy... Uh, commercial aircraft and engines. So we deal with the airlines out there, uh, financing them, leasing them. And uh, I run a group of a small team. I live locally here in Orlando. I'm a private pilot. And uh, that's, that's basically my background. Hello, everyone. My name is Yulia Maluyeva. And uh, I have always been passionate about aviation. It's been since mid school when I was building both plan and uh, static aircraft models, and then I had no doubt where to do my bachelor's degree. So I, I have a um, bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from Moscow Aviation University. Um, after that, I worked for an aircraft manufacturer back in Moscow. And that job gave me an opportunity to travel 30 countries around the world and see that the world of aviation is a lot bigger than just staying in Moscow. So it um, fascinated me a lot and I decided to do my uh, MBA degree. That's how I came to Embry-Riddle and did my MBA degree, finished in 2014. Um, after that, I did an internship at uh, Embry Aircraft Holdings and um, got a full-time job at Spirit Airlines, technical operations. And I never left technical operations ever since. Um, I was an engineer at Spirit and uh, working with Lufthansa Technique very closely on a lot of projects. Then I got offered a job at Lufthansa Technique Component Services, uh, which I did for two and a half years. And uh, just recently I joined Delta Airlines Supply Chain Department. Good afternoon, I'm Roger Smeltzer, and I'm retired from uh, Textron Aviation, which is Beach and Cessna, uh, after 52 years in business and general aviation. And I currently have my own business and general aviation consulting company in Wichita, Kansas. And I started waxing airplanes at 16 years old and went to college in Youngstown, Ohio, at Youngstown State University, and I got a bachelor's degree in business administration, went to school full time and worked my way through the aviation ranks of uh, refueling aircraft and selling aircraft parts and uh, became general manager of the FBO and the MRO and uh, helped start an engine uh, repair shop. And so I've been in, in and out of business development and sales during my career and got a chance to work for uh, Beach Aircraft in Wichita, Kansas, and got a chance to um, work on two new aircraft development programs, the Premier One and the Hawker 4000 back in the 90s, and led a team of people during the design phase of both of those all composite fuselage aircraft by main uh, designing the uh, maintainability, reliability, and supportability of those aircraft before the aircraft were built to keep the cost of the operation down. So a lot of uh, work that went into those aircraft. And then on the sales side, I was a part of the, the sales of 105 King Airs to Kenny Dichter's startup Wheels Up company the membership program uh, that he started in, in 2013. It was a $1.4 billion sale. So I led the support, build a strategy that uh, we did uh, at Beechcraft and it was worth $600 million to the company. So a lot of activity there. I worked for NetJets where I managed uh, uh, 79 Hawker jets and uh, work on the maintainability of all those aircraft. So I've had a quite a, uh, a storied career and I've really enjoyed it. And I didn't graduate here, but I really love coming to Embry-Riddle. I love the people, I love the faculty, I love the students. I do a lot of mentoring 
and I know some of you in the room, and uh, I hope to get to know more of you in the future. So thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kyle Ludwig. I'm the Aviation Marketing Manager at Garmin. And uh, how many of you guys in here are pilots and have used Garmin equipment? Probably everyone sitting in the room, right, considering the fleet at Embry-Riddle. But uh, joined Garmin about a year ago. Previous to that, I worked for three years after graduating here in 2014 uh, on the corporate relations staff here at Embry-Riddle. Uh, got my MBA during that time and then went to work for one of the BLC members, Rick Larson, in the audience today uh, at EAA. Uh, helping with partnership development for that organization until joining Garmin again about a year ago. Um, I am an avid pilot. I fly about 300 hours a year. I own a Mooney um, rated in many of the airplanes that we fly at Garmin are fortunate to travel in. And uh, yeah, thanks for having us here today on the panel. A bit about my background. I am a 1986 graduate of uh, Embry-Riddle Aeronautic University, uh, master's degree in aviation management, bachelor's degree from the Citadel, South Carolina. Uh, when I graduated from Andrew Riddle, um, I wanted to work in airline operations, and of course I was gonna be the CEO of an air, air, airline in five years, for sure. Um, wanted to work for an airline, that's what I wanted to do. Um, that's not the path I took. Uh, right out of here, I did work for a startup carrier, uh, enjoyed it very much, I did not make a lot of money. Um, several pounds bounced paychecks, and life becomes very real. Um, but I enjoyed what I did and I learned a lot. I answered a blind ad in the Washington Post for a sales job as a joke to a friend. And they called and I got an interview and they hired me. It was a very scary thought at the time. Um, and to me, a salesperson was a guy in a very cheap suit who sold you a car that was not gonna last very long. That was, I was convinced that's what a sales guy was. How wrong I was, that was in 1990. And I have been in sales for 31 years. I wouldn't do anything else. Wouldn't do anything else. Aviation sales to me, uh, loved it. I went to work for an airframe MRO. I was responsible uh, for sales uh, for North America. I got promoted to Europe, lived in Europe for five years, based in Copenhagen, covering Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and Russia. Um, came back, time for a change. Um, went to work for Pratt & Whitney Aircraft Engines in Connecticut. Sold jet engines for just shy of 18 years uh, on the aftermarket side initially, and then I sold jet engines for the remainder of that. The last seven years of my time there, um, I worked for IAE, the consortium where I, um, I sold and supported the V2500 engine. Then after that, it was time for a change, and then I went to Delta, and I've been at Delta for the past six years, again in sales. Thread here for me was a passion, the passion about sales, and I'm going to ask each of the panelists the same question. What is it when we go to work every day that really makes us happy? For me, it's ownership. Let me explain that. When you're in sales, you own. You own your customers. You own your customers when the times are good and when the times are not so good. Sales, you always hear about you know, people making big deals and big sales. A good salesperson worth their salt has been through the ringer. You have lost you have been in the doldrums and you've pulled yourself out of it. You've learned your lessons and you've come back and you've convinced your customers that you are ethical and you do what you say you're going to do and you solve problems and you listen. So having said that, I'm going to um, have the panelists go again back to Scott and answer the question, what is it about your job that makes you so happy that you enjoy doing what you do? Simple. Two things. I'm dealing with aircraft and the thrill of getting a deal done. It's, it, as Steve said, it's laborious. It can be painful. Uh, people uh, can, can just go sideways on you. you. You think you've got the deal going the right way and it's not, and you have to solve problems. But when you can get that deal done, there's just some, some great feeling about it. I was walking over here from lunch, found out I just lost a deal on the way here. Had to make a phone call see if there's still a possibility. It's not looking good. So hopefully we, we don't run long here because I, I need to make a call, another call. But anyway, I'm just, I'm, I'm totally joking. No, but that, that's just it. You take the good with the bad. It's, it's, it's uh, you're always living a bit on the edge. But because I do it in aviation, I do with aircraft and that's been my passion. That's the reason I came to Riddle. Uh, that, that just makes it all 
uh, worthwhile because I'm doing it in something that I love. I wish I could actually see aircraft more. I'm actually working from my home right now, this whole COVID thing. That's if, if I had my way, I would have a have an office that overlooked an airport. That would be my, my ultimate goal. But uh, the fact that I get to deal with aviation every single day is, is just terrific. Yeah, definitely working with aircraft, as all of us are passionate about aviation and we are here at Riedel is one of the reasons why the job is so interesting. And another reason I would say uh, each day is very different from the other. So there is no same problem that you face on the day-to-day -day basis. So every day you have a different customer, every day you have to solve different problems, every day you have to sell different product customized to uh, your customer's needs. And that makes it very interesting and unexpected. Every day you don't know what to expect coming into work and you're leaving and you don't know what happens tomorrow. So for me, it was really a challenging, but at the same time, it keeps you running. Every day you come to work and you're fascinated to learn what is next, what, what step you're taking next. I think number one, it's working with people and it's being engaged to, to network and to meet new people. And to give you an example, there's a guy that I met 45 years ago and I still get a Christmas card from him and he's 85 years old. And that's so important to me every year to open up that mailbox and get the Christmas card. And I solved many of his problem and you know who he is, Dick Martin, full of turbo commander all the way from Maine to Youngstown, Ohio, every month. And that's the type of relationships that you need to build. And then to learn, to work on a, a different job and learn. I'm not a mechanic and I'm not an engineer, but to, to be able to refuel an airplane and re to, to sell a part and to learn how to watch an engine being torn down or to learn how to uh, see a, an airplane being put together or maintain an airplane, um, each one of those steps you get to put in your pocket, you might say. And it's not about knowing how to do something. It's knowing how to get the right person to help you to understand how to do something if you don't know how to do it. So it's teaming with a group of people to get something done. I think, uh, you know, a few years ago when I graduated from Ember Roto, I said I always wanted to do something different every day. And I think that's a very cliche thing, right? Everybody says they want to do something different every day. They want challenged every day. But it's true. At Garmin, I think the coolest part is we sell a $500 watch called a D2 Air that you guys can go online today and buy and get the functionality two days later when it's delivered to your front door. Then there's another part of it called... Uh, aftermarket sales, which is you love the Garmin product, you own an airplane, you might want the safety features that Garmin brings you or the new capabilities that Garmin brings you. And we have to sell you on that, you personally, to upgrade your airplane. And then there's a third facet of our business, which is called the OEM business, which is where we sell new avionics to Textron Aviation, uh, to our other partners like Dyer uh, and Piper and others. And that is so diverse, right? Selling a $500 watch to you or a half a million dollar upgrade uh, to a Citation XLS in the retrofit world is so different. The way you sell it is so different. The features that are important, the downtime of an airplane versus the two day shipping that we sell you as well as an upsell. Uh, all of that is so different and so important. And I think that that challenge coupled with the fact that I still get to fly an airplane uh, at least once or twice a week for my job, that is, uh, so cool and something I think a lot of you in the audience say, wow, I'd love to fly for a career. And how cool is it that I get to mix business, a passion of mine with flying, which is uh, something that I've always loved. It's, it's very important. And Nimber Riddle brought those two things together for me. I thought I was going to go fly for a Fortune 500 flight department, use my business degree to manage a big flight department, not unlike Amway or Bank of America or somewhere like that. And once I got a year into my, to my education in the College of Business, I realized this sales thing is pretty dang cool. We should go this route and, and still mix airplanes in there, uh, which is very important to me. When, I, when we first started, I said, pay attention to two things. Pay attention to how our, our, our paths changed from what we thought we were going to do. Remember I mentioned that? Not many people graduate from this university and think about going into sales. Just don't. The reality is, and that's why I said, did sales find us or did we find sales? And I think what you're seeing is sales found us. 
And part of our message to you is what we're talking about, the common threads, all each of our jobs is exceptionally different. We're passionate about aviation. We like what we do. It's a people-oriented field. You get to travel. I haven't mentioned that yet, but you do, sometimes too much. You're faced with adversity. In my personal opinion, one of the things as a salesperson that drives me, that, that really pumps me up, is taking a really crappy situation and turning it around. That, to me, it gives me as much of a rush as winning a deal. When I first came to Pratt & Whitney as an engine salesperson, I was aftermarket for a while. One of the good news is I became, an after, I became a, a jet engine salesperson. Awesome. Bad news is you get the worst customers, right? They give you the bottom of the heap. Well, let me tell you, when you get the bottom of the heap, you can only go up. So the work that you put in, you, you, do you know what, what a rush it is to turn around a customer that is unhappy with you, that doesn't like you, that has very little money, and you're a young, passionate, energetic, I'm chewing red meat, I'm so happy to be a sales guy selling jet engines. And they loved it. So I turned customers around. So I took them from the bottom of the barrel, and put them up here, not here, but up here. You know what a rush it was for them? to be treated like that? And it was for me to see that difference? I didn't need to win a $100 million deal to be happy. That turned me around. I'm giving you my sales secrets. I shouldn't even tell you that. Always get, when, when, when you're brand new, you always get the customers nobody else wants, but you're starting from here. And it's, it's quite a rush to turn that around. So what I'd like to do is to ask the panel, back to what I was talking about, what path did you choose and how did it change? And I'll start with Kyle this time. So the path you chose, it moved around. And what would you change? And what would, what would you keep the same? It's a, it's a tough question, a good question, though. Um, you know, I've had an interesting path compared to a lot of other folks, because I've got to see what it's like to work at a major nonprofit organization in EA, and what that means to serve your membership base, 240,000 members at EA have the world's largest aviation event in AirVenture Oshkosh, to then serve a publicly traded for-profit company in Garmin. I think that that path alone uh, has, has kind of shown a lot of change, right? You're serving the membership organization, you're serving the divisions of EAA and our partnerships there versus how do we, how do we truly make money at Garmin? How do I market our products better uh, to sell more of them at the end of the day and, uh, and make sure that shareholder is happy and as well as your employee base? So, um, you know, that to me, I never dreamed that I would see both spectrums in both directions. Like I said, I thought I was going to go fly a Gulfstream uh, and sit in the left seat of a Gulfstream flying globally. Uh, but the coolest part, uh, to kind of Steve's point, is seeing those partnerships that we brought together at EAA, uh, just like the one with United Aviate, not unlike the, the partnership that embry has uh, with United Airlines, uh, the partnerships that I kind of made as a intern at Delta Airlines, an intern in network planning at Delta Airlines, never thought I'd work uh, at one of the, the world's top uh, carriers, right? That's a pretty cool experience. And so, um, again, literally the reason I came to Embry-Riddle to go fly a Gulfstream, sit in the left seat and fly globally has never been what I've done. Uh, and I think that's a cool story to be told uh, because of, you know, how exciting my career has been since. Um, but, yeah, I think that answers the question, right? I probably wouldn't change a whole lot. I've, I've got a chance to do so much in my career. And I get asked the question, why didn't I get my MBA? And my wife will say, you got a doctorate degree in aviation. Why do you need to go get an MBA? But uh, all three of my adult children have MBAs. And that was one of my goals was to make sure they all got MBAs. And I, I wish I would have gotten my MBA just to say I have my MBA. But when I went to college in the 70s, nobody in my family or my extended family had degrees. So I was the first one that had a degree. And I was so busy raising my kids and working on my career that I thought, well, if I got my degree, I was doing something really special. And then trying to climb the ladder to become a VP of a large company it took me 38 years, almost 40 years to become a VP. And I achieved that goal. 
But how many here know what a Beechcraft Starship is? An all composite aircraft. I got to fly right seat with a customer after maintenance in a Beechcraft Starship. And you wanna have a rush is to lift off in a Beechcraft Starship. And I got to take the controls and fly it around the pattern. And that's pretty cool. And, uh, but some of the things that I've done in aviation have just been amazing. And I think I do them all over again, including waxing planes. And uh, Rick knows what I'm talking about. It's, it's, <laughs> it's pretty fun. So, so I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask Julia a slightly different question. <laughs> As a young woman in aviation, a relatively recent graduate of Emory Riddle, I'd like for you to tell us what it's been like, your path since graduation to get where you are at Delta today. I'm sure the young ladies in the audience would like to hear from you about, about your path and what you took and the challenges that you faced. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I have another twist in my story, in my career story. I'm also an international student and I came from Russia with one suitcase and um, Starting from scratch, starting, starting from zero, I was very lucky to be here at Emory Riddle because you have so many opportunities and everything is open to you, to, to all students. I was very fortunate to be offered uh, a position of graduate research assistant while I was doing my MBA degree. So um, it helped me in many ways, including building my uh, network with the professors and students. And I had other opportunities that were, co that were coming up uh, out of that, so I always participated in everything that was out there. <laughs> so I was always traveling and um, taking on new challenges. Um, after graduating from Embry Riddle, it also helps a lot because the school is well recognized. And when you submit your applications, they know what expectations school has for the students. So it was relatively easy to get into aviation industry. Um, of course, as a young woman in aviation, it had its own challenges because I love technical operations and technical operations is still very dominated by um, men. And uh, it's, I can't say it makes a huge difference, but at the same time, you have to work hard and harder to succeed and to earn the trust um, that you can do the job. And I was an engineer at Spirit and I was pretty young and you have to work with mechanics who are a lot older than you in a lot of cases. And they know a lot about aircraft and you come out of school basically and you have to tell them what to do and write out the instructions for them. So that was an interesting challenge and for that I would work just a regular day. And then after that, I would drive to the airport and hit the night shift with mechanics and work half shift with them and just follow them around and see what they're doing. So basically just following the same paperwork that I wrote out and see what they do to make sure that I'm doing a good job writing it out and collecting the feedback and showing them the interest and showing that I'm working on it and improving it for them. And thus, it took me <laughs> some three years to make a lot of improvements and earn trust and be one of the engineers that they had no problem picking up the phone and calling me and asking questions and knowing that I will do a great job for them. So I think, yeah, that's no, was one of the twists that, that ladies would have to face in the world of technical operations in the airlines. And I think it's it's challenging, but if you have that zest for a challenge, I think you will enjoy it. Thank you. Uh, Scott, my question for you is, you had a <laughs> very circuitous path through aviation to get where you are today. My question to you is, what about your background would you say was the best foundation for wh what you do today? Hmm. Well, Steve's known me for a long time, so he probably already has his thought of what that answer might be. Um, but what uh, what was it? Uh, well, 
Look, at the end of the day, uh, as I've already mentioned, aviation was just the biggest passion that I had. Uh, so it was just a matter of finding myself within this group and what I, what I want to do in this industry. And, uh, you know, I, I never really thought of myself as a salesperson, but I realized that I communicate well with people. I think I get along with people and, and that seemed to go a long way as, as it comes to selling. Just, just being able to relate to people was, uh, was something that I felt I did really well. And uh, I, I, I always thought I'd be a pilot. I had my private pilot's license before I even came here. My father was a pilot. You know, I'm going to Embry-Riddle, what else would it be? And then, uh, and then I, I realized, you no, know, I think I want to chart my own course, do something different. So I, I, I pursued the business side of it. Uh, but not knowing, and then uh, what I want to do, I, uh, I, I, as I said, I got a, a position at uh, an industry newsletter, start reporting on aircraft transactions, and then um, one day, a good friend who I'd met in the industry, who's in this room, named Damon D'Agostino, he reached out to me and said, I know where there's a marketing job at a leasing company, because I know you're very interested in that world, and got the job just like that. I mean, I came and put in the words, it was so wonderful. But I think, again, it was the relationships and the, that I had developed with the people in that team. I didn't know the first thing about leasing an aircraft, but I had built a relationship with people in the industry and that, that served me well. And uh, I, I can't say enough about, about getting to know people and, 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 and building relationships amongst your peers here, amongst people that you're going to meet going forward. Just, just volunteer, raise your hand, build relationships, and it'll get you a long way. Because if you're not sure what you want to do, and you might be thinking, well, I might want to be a pilot, might want to do something else, or whatever it may be, that was my situation. You know, it, just, just keep the doors open. You're young, keep them open. So I'm going to bring, bring back a couple of threads that the five of us have been talking about, and then I'm going to turn it over to you all, ask questions of us. Couple things, you've heard it a couple times now. Um, our careers took many turns. Um, in, in some cases, sales came to us, but the reality is we embraced it. We embraced it and we liked it. Just like Scott said, I think we're all in the same boat. We ended up loving what we did and had no idea we were gonna love it. And we loved it because for a number of reasons. So as you look at opportunities for your career, and your opportunities. Keep your minds open. We talk about the network. Um, I came here a couple months ago and I was in a class and a student raised her hand and she said, where do I go to get that? And I said, excuse me? She said, where do you go to get the network? And I said, it's virtual and it's virtual to you. It's what you make it. So the network, and I'll give you another super secret sales guy, can't promise to tell anybody, nobody's here, that's right. Salespeople have the best networks by a hundredfold. We're out there, we're on the road, we meet people, we go to conferences, we go to trade shows, we meet events. Our, the Rolodex doesn't exist anymore. It's an, it's an iPhone now, by the way. We say the word Rolodex, it doesn't, it doesn't exist. It's pretty amazing. In my entire career, the number of times I actually took a job that I applied for that I saw online, one. The rest was through the network. And the network is what you make it. So what Scott said about the network is exceptionally true. I can't say it enough. I was in a class yesterday and I said, look to your left, look to your right. That's the beginning of your network, whether you realize it or not. Your classmates in college, perfect. You guys are going to stay in aviation, most of you for the rest of your lives. Okay, so your turn. You've heard from us, you've heard us say a couple things. It's your turn to put the squeeze on us. So please don't be shy. Come on, bring the question. I'll bring you the mic, you bring the questions. Hi, I'm Liza, I have a question. So is there anything that you um, told yourself as you were going through adversities to keep your head up and to keep soaring through? That's a good question, Roger. How do you push through adversity? 
what what drives you through. I think you have to be persistent and you have to look at the end game and see if you can really, really solve the problem and to make sure that um, that you can find a solution and, and you have a problem. Sorry about that. And that you have uh, a team behind you that you can use as a resource. And if you can't find the problem through problem solving, you go back to that person and ask for help and ask for more definite um, circumstances. Uh, what leads you to this problem and uh, find any resource you can in the company or in, in your network to solve the problem. I wanna take a stab at it. I think the coolest part about adversity is when you win after the fact, right? So you're down, you're struggling hard, it's a tough day at work or you're challenging, or you have, you're facing a tough challenge rather. And the coolest part is when you come out the other end successful, right? Be it you turned a relationship around with a customer, you win a billion dollar King Air deal uh, with wheels up, whatever it might be, they, those, those things didn't come together just by the flip of a switch or by one piece, right? And I think the coolest part is that feeling of overcoming something or, or moving on to that next challenge uh, is the coolest part. I think that's kind of instinctively what makes salespeople uh, really passionate about what they do, right? They're ready for that next challenge. Uh, so I feel like adversity is kind of baked in the sales, uh, the sales equation at the uh, beginning of the day. I've always found that uh, some of the toughest people to deal with become your best customers in the end. A, a key component to remember about customers is customers, I'm probably gonna get in trouble for this, but are like large adolescent children. They're highly demanding. Um, they, they want attention. They wanna talk, they wanna be listened to and they want you to help solve their problems. And everything I said is absolutely true to anything. I don't care what you sell. I don't care if you sell shower curtain rings or jet engines or what it may be. Customers in this context are quite similar. Salespeople who are good, zip it after a while and let the customer talk. They're gonna tell you a lot. In fact, a good salesperson will prompt their customer to talk more. Why? Market intelligence. Taking a customer out to dinner, it's just not about having a dinner and talking. It's about, you know, in the marketplace, I'm gonna hear about my competition. They're gonna tell you, let them go, let them take the leash and run. It's amazing, I'm writing it all down. Good customers love to, you know, if you're a good listener, a customer wanna talk to you. And pulling that out of them is a skill that's learned. And the reality is, and it's all been said here, you can turn a bad situation, adversity around. And it doesn't mean you necessarily solve the problem 100%. Did you listen? Were you honest? I said in a class this morning, and some of you may have been in there, been in sales a long time. If you've been in sales a long time, your reputation precedes you, whether you change companies or not. And I'm gonna tell you something. You're gonna have some hard conversations with customers. You don't need to tell them everything, but whatever you tell them, better be the truth. If you don't think it's gonna come back around, it will. You don't need to tell the customer everything. Trust me, you don't wanna tell the customer everything. But the reality is whatever you do tell them, better be the truth. You make a commitment, you follow up to that commitment. That's how you get repeat business. That's how you turn a customer around who was treated poorly, maybe by the same company and a different salesperson, maybe by a competitor and not such a good salesperson. Scott. Okay, on uh, motivating during adversity, um, you could say you're a self-starter. You could say, uh, you know, I, I, I'm determined. For me, at the end of the day, a young person, motivation, the apartment rent, car payment. Those don't go away. What else is gonna motivate you? I don't wanna lose my apartment. Once you get that, and once you learn how to deal with the adversity, you'll thrive on it in the long term. 
But at first, that's what's going to motivate you in many ways. It's like, oh, now I'm married, child. Well, I, 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 that's my motivation now. I'm supporting. So a lot of it's that. But once you get past those steps and you learn how to deal with it, then, 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 then you'll thrive on in sales. Julia. For me, I would say what motivates me is an opportunity of growing. And when you finish the school, you come out of your MBA degree or your bachelor's degree, and you come out to the actual work experience, you think you got it all. You, you took this class, you took that class, you did amazing projects with your professors. And that seems that you're already a great specialist in something. And then you come to work and you realize that you still have a lot to learn. And every day you will realize that you still have a lot to learn. So beating on this craft is something that motivates me to become a better specialist, a better professional, every single day, doing something different, finding new ways, talking to new people, meeting a lot of interesting people. It changes your perspectives. And um, yeah, it's definitely a huge motivation. Questions? Got to be more questions. Yes. Um, how do you deal with like, competition? Sorry, the question was, how do we focus on... Like, how do you deal with competition for you, like, not worry about it, just, like, focus on yourself? No, it's a, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, Scott, we'll start with you. Um, usually when it just comes to competition, uh, it's, it's just trying to put the, the right product out for the, what the party needs and not worrying so much about what the competition is doing other than you're positioning yourself to try to win it in the best way that you can win it, do the, the best pricing, try to give the best product, and then just know that and know the market. So know what you're putting out there is, is competitive, that you're putting it out there at competitive pricing so that you can win the business, you know, while, while making sure that the bottom line is protected and everything's okay. But at the end of the day, uh, from my standpoint, when I deal, if I'm trying to police an engine or an aircraft or something to that effect, it's it's just making sure that uh, you know I'm I'm pricing it the right way. Roger, I think you really have to know your competition, and you have to understand what they have to sell as well, um, because if you understand, then you can sometimes be ahead of them or at least stay up with them and then you have to be good enough that your customer believes in you as well so that you have a chance to compete in the market just like them because sometimes you're you're not going to win you're you're, you're not going to get all the business Con. yeah i think um it's interesting. Garmin has a lot of very formidable competitors, right? I want to speak about my current employer. It's, it's fairly interesting. So look at the defense side of our business. So the commercial aviation side of, of who we really compete against in the avionics business. And you're talking about Honeywell and Rockwell Collins, very big, formidable competitors that have been around for three times longer than Garmin's been a company. Um, so just that, that lineage of doing business is so much longer. The experience that they have inside those walls and in the computers is so much more vast than what we have, but we compete with them every day, right? We do. Uh, we just won a, a U.S. Navy program to retrofit the whole F5N fleet of aggressors, uh, which should have probably, if you look at it, the surface, should have gone to Rockwell or should have gone to Honeywell. And guess what? Garmin won it. And uh, so I think Look at your competitors at face value. Uh, somebody else on the panel said, really know your competitor's product uh, and how they position themselves in the market. Know your, your instinctive advantages. It's not always price and it's not always features. Combine those two together. And at the end of the day, relationships, we've hit on it a million times. We'll hit on it a million times again. Uh, the reason we win a lot of our business is because of those relationships. But I want to hit on that for a second, too, because uh, I think a lot of folks, especially in college, look at it and say, what the heck is a relationship? Does that mean that I had to sit down with someone and I know everything about them inside and out, backwards and forwards? No, it means that you and I met each other at a panel discussion at Emory Riddle. We had a five-minute discussion. I see you in the industry 10 years later and say, oh, my gosh, I met him. 
he asked a question about our competition. That was such a good question, and I'd love to help you. You know what I mean? That's a relationship and the start of a relationship, right? So um, can't hit that home enough, but, but yeah, just being honest with yourself and, and really getting after the business side of it. Uh, again, we compete, like I said, at Garmin for the watch space against Apple all the way up to Honeywell and Rockwell Collins, and, and we win uh, almost every day. So it's a, a pretty cool thing to be competitive in the market. It's a very good question, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention something. It's very important. In the United States, we are governed by the FCPA, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Anybody in a sales capacity in any company has to, every year, get trained and sign a statement. And that statement is a legal document. It means that we have not engaged in any illegal activities, either domestically or internationally. And it goes in my file, and I've had to sign that for the past 30 years, every year. I take that training, and that is very important. And the reason why we get trained every year, because some of you may say, well, why do you get trained every year? It's the same thing. That's the whole point. The FCPA changes. I can tell you right now things that occurred to me 15 years ago that are no longer allowed to be legal today. I'm not going to get into the detail, but the bottom line is you need to be informed. You need to be educated, and you need to be careful. People go to jail for doing things about sharing competitors' information. For example, if I'm sitting at a customer and I and we're sitting having lunch and they hand me my competitor's offer, is that okay? Is that not okay? 10 years ago it was, not today. That's an illegal activity if I were to take that document. If I were to use it, I'd be wearing an orange jumpsuit by June. I'm serious, it's very serious. So in, in, in the sales world, you need to be mindful of that. So part of what I enjoy about sales is in this very, very fascinating, amazing world of sales, it is, it's an area where you really, you have to be on your toes. And, and by that, I mean, we talked about business ethics, doing the right thing, staying true to yourself, being honest with your customer, listening, these are all things we do in our daily lives, and we do it for our jobs, and we love it. I can't say enough. More questions, please. Uh, my question is, what's the best way to follow up with someone so that we may reinforce those relationships? Is it through LinkedIn, maybe an email? Any other, please? I don't think there's there's no right or wrong answer to this, right? I think uh, uh, it depends. That's the classic answer. No, seriously, uh, I think you know in big business, for instance, we're negotiating a contract with an OEM at Garmin. Of course, the official way there's still something to a handwritten note, right? There's still something to that typed out letter that has a real signature with a real pen at the bottom of it. You're talking tens or hundreds of millions of dollars in business, and so. That is a formal way. I think LinkedIn's a great thing, right? It is truly your professional digital resume. Uh, you know, you can tell or really tell a lot about someone by how they update their LinkedIn, how active they are, how they interact with others on LinkedIn. So I think that's a great way. And there's something to be said, especially in our generation, right? I'll speak to our generation. Uh, maybe Yuli can too. But I mean, connecting with them on LinkedIn uh, or excuse me, on uh, Instagram uh, or Facebook, right? There's nothing wrong with reaching out to them through those kind of non-traditional uh, social media platforms. I think it makes it a little more informal. Again, I said it depends because if you're interviewing with Garmin, with Delta Airlines, with Textron Aviation, you're probably not going to go friend the person on Facebook and then say how great the interview was. Uh, but if you meet them today on this panel and you say, wow, cool, Yuli has some great Instagram content from working at Delta. I'd love to follow that, follow her journey and maybe reach out to her through a DM. Uh, and say, hey, would love to see more of it. Keep me in mind for future opportunities. I think that's perfectly fine too. So again, it depends, but just think it through. Is this really the right path? Informal or formal, written or, or uh, electronic, it either way works. I'll give you another sales secret. Follow-up is really important. Of course it is. If you say you're going to do something, you better do it. You think your customer is going to know that? You bet they are. <clears throat> Here's the secret. You have a discussion with a customer about whatever it may be. It may be an innocuous conversation about, about something. They're not expecting something from you, but you proactively give it to them. I 
remember from our conversation last week, you mentioned this. I thought I'd get back to you and, and show this to you. You want to impress a customer? Give them information they didn't ask for. I'm going to tell you something. You want to make a customer happy and impress them, you do that. I remembered from our dinner conversation, you mentioned something about this. I thought I'd, I thought I'd get back to you and let you know I looked into that. And I did so-and-so. Holy smokes. The customer will remember that. Julia. Yeah, it's really hard to add something, but uh, about, yeah, the follow-up. Uh, it really depends, I agree with Kyle, but uh, I mean, in the beginning of relationship, if you have a brand new customer, it's probably better to keep it more official. I wouldn't jump on their profile on LinkedIn and just say, hi, new customer, you know, we have this amazing product we have here. So I would probably find the appropriate contact inside the company and find the email address and put together the information, everything about your product that you would like to market to them. And then when you already build on relationship, I think it's, um, it's totally appropriate. If you have their phone number, it's okay to text or give them a call within the business hours, of course. Um, so that's from my professional experience, it was the better way to approach them. Scott, you got any comments on follow-up? Just, just do it. Always follow up. Simple as that. It's, you're never going to be wrong about it necessarily. Do whatever your gut says is how you should follow up, but always follow up. Be a good, be a good uh, client, you know, a good customer. Be a good, good uh, you know, business person. Always do it. Hi. Just as Steve was mentioning, so for sales, it's more about networking and knowing how to uh, manage people and have the connections. And to all the panel, like, what's your opinion on is the sales, uh, is your customer yours or the company's? Now, at that point, you uh, this might be more applicable for people that might want to jump through different companies, test out different uh, 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 companies and where to work for. In your opinion, or has it changed? Is the is the customer yours, or the salesperson, so or the company? It's a it's actually a very good question, and it's very unique to our industry, because not not unique, but it's very it's an important discussion for our industry because we have a tendency to stay in aviation, but change hats. So especially if you're in sales, you change companies, you wear a different hat, but you're the same person. Yes, you represent the company you wear the hat of. The way I looked at it was this. My integrity comes first as an individual. I happen to represent Delta Airlines right now, and I'm happy to do so. When I worked for Pratt & Whitney, I felt just as passionate about wearing the Pratt & Whitney hat, but I was Steve Becker first. At the end of the day, they're not going to close a deal because I'm Pratt & Whitney. They're going to close a deal because of me or my team, the team that I'm part of. It's a very good question and one that people struggle with because there, there are differences of opinion. Some people believe, no, I'm, 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 I'm Delta through and through. I'm Delta first. Well, well, if you're Delta first and you don't follow up and, and your professionalism isn't very good, you think Delta is going to be very happy to have you represent them? I'm going to go with a no on that. So it's you first. Roger. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Steve. I think you have to you have to go with you first because that's who the connection is with the trust. And it goes along with the follow-up question that you had because you want them to know your email address and your phone number and if that's consistent and how they can contact you and how you can contact them. And you want them to know where you're at and if you have any changes to your your contact information as well. But you want that to carry on through your career, and especially sometimes as many times as we make changes in our career, uh, especially the way companies buy companies today and change change hands and then we change hats. Uh, it, it goes along with saying, we gotta keep that, that flow going so people know who we work for, but uh, us, us first is the most important. You've got about five minutes left, so um, questions, more questions. Yes. Hi, um, I actually have 
two questions, I guess. My name is Daisy. I'm actually currently pursuing my second year MBA degrees in the COB. And thanks again for holding this discussion. It's really insightful. Um, my question may be more towards um, Roger and Steve. I'm guessing you mentioned that you've been working with Hexstrom of a number of years, and then you started your own consulting companies. Uh, I'm just wondering why, what in your mind, why you um, decided to have the, um, you know, pursuing the consulting um, industry, and then what's the experience in Hexstrom that helped you to benefit? Um, the other thing I was wondering is. Um, for the young graduate, especially for the business MBA um, graduate students, um, when they de deciding um, from a general aviation background or an airline background, how would they uh, pick it? Like that. How did I pick the general aviation background? Between <laughs> pick me <laughs> yeah so um because i came from a background uh, both um general aviation and airline so right now okay. i'm kind of deciding which path to go towards it so i'm just wondering um what kind of advice we'll give it to the young graduate well it, it I, I think it it picked me because i was two miles from the airport and you know i just worked my way through the whole general aviation ranks and i just stayed with it because i started learning through and and uh getting into the fbo and the mro and then uh, working for beechcraft and then they built the the ga airplanes so it was sort of easy for me to continue through that process but along the way I learned a lot about airliners. I mean, I learned about, we had regional airliners that we built. I learned the, the fleet management side of them. I learned the cargo side of them. Um, I managed a fleet of, uh, of Federal Express caravans. So there was uh, not the airliner side, but the cargo side of it. So there was a lot of mixed things that went on with that. Uh, even though I wasn't in the airline side. I got a chance to refuel a lot of airliners during my career, so there was some mixed things there. But I think the focus was there on the business side, and I wanted to stay with the business side, so I, I chose that path and stayed with it. But I always knew that I wanted to stay in aviation, and I knew that down the road, once I retired, I wanted to, to do consulting. But there were a couple times in the career I got laid off, so I knew that if I didn't get a job, I could at least consult during that time. And there was a six month period where I was laid off where I did some work for a company as a consultant. So that's, that's where I went. We have a few minutes left. I, I think she had a couple of comments. She wanted the new, newer graduates to, to weigh in. So I'm gonna ask Kyle and Yulia both. Sure. I, I might give a little untraditional answer here, but I don't think you have to pick. Um, think about it like this. I started my career uh, looking at both joint aviation and airline opportunities for Embry-Riddle, right? How do we sell the university to corporate partners? Uh, so I got to work with them both. That's a pretty cool role. Uh, then I went to EAA, which it was mostly a general aviation organization, right? But it's not to say we didn't have relationships with folks like United. We had a great relationship with United Airlines that's growing and thriving at EAA. So uh, I kind of saw that side of the business. And now at Garmin, I lead our marketing efforts towards the commercial aviation world, but I would consider myself at a general aviation company. That's what Garmin's historically been. So at the end of the day, I think there are roles out there where you don't have to pick, and that's super cool because uh, you get different opportunities because of it. But also think of it like this too. I've already had three jobs in aviation, and I would say that they were all three tremendous opportunities, right? I mean, they they challenged me in woefully different ways. and. Uh, I have 30 years of a career left. I think that's pretty cool. I could stay with GA for another 20 and end my career at the airlines, or I could go, heck, I could go fly the airlines for 15 or 20 years in the, in the coming years and then go in my career uh, on the joint aviation side for another 10. So don't uh, think that you have to pick one side or the other. It isn't football, go Chiefs. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of opportunity out there. Just keep that in mind. Julia. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And I just wanted to tell you that you don't have to put so much pressure on yourself choosing right now, because again, you can start with something. And then once your goals change, the world of aviation is so huge. You can always have different opportunities. You can always move inside the company. In my career, I moved around different companies a lot. 
and changed my career paths a few times. So that's why it's really hard to pick something when you just recent graduate, but then it develops as you develop, as your goals develop, you can always choose something else. So just don't, don't feel the pressure. I think we're in the final minute of this amazing 60 minutes. I want to say thank you to this phenomenal panel of very wide ranging and diverse backgrounds. Uh, Scott, Yulia, Roger, and Kyle. Let's give them applause. Thank you. We're going to be we're, we're going to be around for a little bit. So as we as we as we as Dean Gibson closes it out, um, we're going to be around. So if you have any questions, you want to come up to us, we're going to be here. Please feel free to do so. This has been a pleasure. Um, I hope you found it beneficial, insightful. Um, uh, again, great choice to be here today. Good choice. Thank you. Thank you. I think they said it best. I'll say it one last time. The opportunities in aviation, aerospace, and space are unlimited. The business of flight is vast. The opportunities can't even be delineated. And whichever way you go, if it doesn't work, if it zigs, you can zag. So just keep looking, see what's out there. And let's give our thanks to our members up here on the panel. And thank you to all of you for coming here and being part of it. Have a good day.